the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. The beginning of this gospel passage from St. Matthew, it says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus. What was that time is that right before this in the Gospel of Matthew, um, people come to Peter the Apostle, who is known to be a very close associate of the Lord Jesus Christ, even more so than the other disciples. And this, these people came to Peter the Apostle and asked him if his master pays the temple tax. They were suspicious that he wasn't doing so, but because they didn't want to approach the Lord Jesus Christ himself, they just went to his second in, in command, so to speak, his secretary, that is, you know, Peter the Apostle, and, it, and asked him, does your master pay the temple tax? So the Lord Jesus Christ tells Peter, uh, go, and at first he gives him a lesson that it's, it's not sons that pay taxes, but those that are hired and those that are, that are slaves or, or, or employees. So he establishes for St. Peter that as a son of God and as children of God, we are not uh, um, obligated financially, but we give out of the, the abundance of our heart. But then having said that, he tells Peter, go and, and fish a fish out of the sea. Open the fish. You're going to find two coins in the fish. And you're going to give those two coins to the, to the temple, one for you and one for me. One is your temple tax, Peter, and one is my temple tax that they're asking about. So what happens, the other disciples hearing this felt a little jealous, felt that the Lord Jesus Christ is playing favorites when he is kind of effecting this miracle to find money in a fish. And that money is going not for any of their taxes, which was quite a sizable tax. It's a big financial obligation, but just for him and Peter. So then it says at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and instead of facing him head on with, with their complaints, Instead of saying, you are favoring Peter, and why are you doing so? They go about a roundabout way to ask him that. And they ask him, Lord, who then, having experienced all of this, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? In other words, is, is, is Peter better than us? Is Peter in a, 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 a favorite of you because he's going to be, is this situation going to continue in the kingdom? Just so we know, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And so... What we're seeing here is the jealousy of the other disciples. And we are still in the month of Abib, where we have just celebrated the Feast of the Apostles. And as I mentioned last week, we are meditating on the meaning of the church. So it's not just a story that is happening between the disciples 2,000 years ago, but it's very much reflective and relevant for who we are today as a church. Again, a group of people uh, with various roles, various personalities, that are the body of Christ, a family. As I just mentioned earlier in my announcements, the church is our home and it is what we wanna make out of it. If you don't wanna have a festival uh, and uh, we don't have the, the finances to, to build the beautiful church that we wanna build or the hall that we wanna build, that is ultimately your decision, not mine. So in the same way today, we are continuing to meditate on what it means to be a healthy family what it means to be children of God and greatest in the kingdom of heaven individually. So the Lord Jesus Christ takes on this opportunity of their question and, and does the following. He, br he brings a little child into their midst and says, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you're converted and become like that little kid, you will by no means enter the kingdom, not just be greatest or least, but you won't even be there if you're not like a little child. He's using child as an example, um, precisely because of the expectations and the, the, the shared assumptions between him and all the grown-ups he's talking to about the good qualities of a child. What makes an ideal child? What makes, an, unfortunately, an unideal child? And I'm saying this because we know, even from raising our own children, that no child is ideal. No child is perfect. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ sets the kid in the midst and says, unless you be converted like this kid, he's not saying that this particular kid is perfect, nor is he saying that children generally as a species, as a group, are all perfect and all humble and all uh, 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 lacking in pride. But he is pointing out to, to these perceived ideas of what a child should be like, of what we expect a child especially to be like. Someone who is innocent, someone who is humble, 
someone who does not have the, the distortion of what humility is, which is pride, which leads to uh, a seeking after vain glory. He is, he is creating this lesson for us because a child shouldn't be like this. Not that every child is in fact like this. In fact, we often even raise our own children to be competitive, to strive to be the best at whatever they do, to, uh, to be the top of the class, to be the best deacon in the group, to be the kid that's gonna get up here and, and go around the altar with a guna and do the things and we're gonna take pictures of him and uh, uh, be very proud of him. And that is a very human emotion. I would, I would probably feel the same way in your situation. Um, but when this desire to promote our children or even ourselves, let's put ourselves in this position, when that desire to, to excel reaches a certain level uh, beyond what is appropriate, it becomes a liability. It becomes a spiritual problem. Why? The person who is desiring praise uh, uh, at all times is then somebody that is very difficult to correct. They become very incorrigible because they're always seeking around for the thanks of people around them, for the praise of people around them, people propping them up and telling them that they are doing a great job. And once they hear a dissenting voice, well, there's something here you could approve on, there's something here, an area in your life where you should be uh, growing. Uh, it's very difficult to listen to that because it's the one odd voice among the chorus of, of, of people that praise him. And so then it becomes very difficult for us to grow, very difficult for us to repent. Repentance, by definition, assumes that I'm doing something not great, not praiseworthy, that I want to repent from and turn around from and move back towards in a different direction from. And so repentance becomes difficult. Growth becomes difficult. Return to God becomes difficult when it all starts with an innate and a very natural human desire for praise, a very natural human desire for acknowledgement, for uh, uh, being thanked for doing everything we want, we, we do, and being told that we are the best of the best and we are doing such a wonderful job. It even enslaves a person, a person who is operating primarily uh, in an attempt to find praise from others, that becomes the principle for them, not what is right and what is wrong. And so it becomes then an issue because, because the person then is not operating based on integrity, based on appropriateness, based on a moral code that is above them and above their personality altogether, but their own personality, their own desire for praise becomes the, the compass. If I do this thing, people will notice that I'm a good person, that I'm a talented person, that I'm a gifted person, so I'll do this thing. If I do this other thing that may also be good, but it's not as noticeable, well, then I'm not gonna get any social credit here. So maybe I shouldn't do that. And that becomes the calculus that we're applying to this. And so that's why the Lord ultimately uh, 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 says the kind of the latter half of this gospel is kind of a shocking message to us when we hear it. And he says, if, uh, you know, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. If your eye causes you to sin, cast it and pluck it out from you. And it is better for you to enter the kingdom of heaven uh, uh, lame or without a hand or foot and without an eye than having these things to be cast into hell. What is the Lord trying to tell us here is that humility is to not think of ourselves so much. To be willing to sacrifice even our own ego, even our own body. He's using the body here, I think, as an extension, as an example of the self. Thinking less of oneself. C.S. Lewis said, uh, said it very uh, eloquently when he said, Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Oh, I'm the worst. I'm bad at everything. I am not as good as so and so and so. I'm not as tall. I'm not as muscular. I'm not, I don't have as good a voice. I am the worst of the worst. That's not humility. Humility is thinking less often of yourself and thinking of others. The center of your thought process is not you and the praise you might get from others and the acknowledgement you might get from others, but it's others' needs, the church's needs. And with this kind of mentality in mind, humility is not necessarily taking the back seat. Humility is not necessarily getting to the end of the line. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. Sometimes, and that's especially the case for those of us in leadership positions, uh, whether in our jobs or whether in church, 
somebody like Mina, for example, he's not here right now, so I can talk about him. Uh, Mina is the, the de facto choir leader of our church. Is that lack of humility on his part to be taken the first place, to be taking the microphone, to be uh, uh, applying his talent for the benefit of the whole church? No. It's thinking less of himself and what he wants. Maybe he wants to sit in the back. Maybe his desire is to, is, to, is to not be having this role at all, having this responsibility. But thinking less of oneself means thinking more of the benefit of the whole church. What does the church need? Where is God asking me to apply myself to? And that is humility. So humility is not necessarily shunning one's responsibility and saying, I will be uh, quiet, not uh, say anything, not contribute to anything, uh, you know, be the person basically that is invisible to everybody else. Not necessarily. Humility can also be taking positions of leadership, uh, 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 deciding to apply oneself as best as possible, even at the expense of their own peace, at the expense of their own comfort, or at the expense of their own uh, desires for themselves. And that is what church is all about. It's not, uh, uh, it's not about us coming here and uh, promoting each other or just simply rejoicing in, in our kids taking positions of leadership or getting up here and doing things or getting the microphone and watching them and being happy for them. Uh, then we're just self-congratulating. Then we're just kind of uh, here to, to get a chance to feel good about ourselves and our kids. No, it's teaching them how to serve. Service. Service for real. Uh, sometimes we use the word service as, uh, as, as a synonym for liturgical services, uh, for being deacon. But who's thinking of service as taking out the trash? Who's thinking of service as cleaning the kitchen, uh, the kitchen uh, countertops or uh, picking up plates after people? I know all these things get done, but it's much more important to focus with our children, especially that that is what service is. That is service. It's not uh, glamorous. It's not uh, necessarily going to get you the, the praise of others and uh, to, to put you on a, in, a, in the spotlight. It's not something you're probably going to pull out your phone and take a video of. <laughs> but, uh, but it is something that is actually service and is actually for the good of the whole church. I hope I didn't offend anybody with this and it's just kind of came naturally from the gospel. That's what the, the Lord is telling us today in the gospel. That humility is to be like little children. To not seek praise, to not seek the attention or uh, the spotlight. And in that sense, then, we can truly become uh, the apostolic one body of Christ that the church is. To God be glory now and ever, and unto the ages of all ages. Amen.